Welcome to our first entry in the series of discussions related to Disney properties. In this entry we will be discussing whether or not the 2005 movie Robots, produced by Blue Sky Studios and distributed by 20th Century Fox, is transphobic. Robots may not have originally been a Disney film, but since Disney acquired 20th Century Fox in 2019, it counts as a Disney film. I feel it's also worth mentioning that although Disney owns 20th Century Fox Studios, it doesn't own Fox News, Disney acquired Fox's entertainment division, not its now separated news division. This means Disney is not connected to anything going on over there. That's not to say Disney isn't a company which hasn't done its own horrible things, such as its recent support towards the transphobic bills being promoted and implemented in Texas, which Disney CEO Bob Chapek has since apologised for. I of course don't support Disney's consistent queerphobic views, but I do support its many queer creators and employees and their allies who are fighting and challenging from within the company to change Disney's problematic relationship with the queer community. This is why I believe it's important to continue having discussions on their art and challenging it, like we will be doing with the film Robots. With that out of the way, let's begin. What is Robots about? If, like me, it has been a hot minute since you saw the movie Robots, I recommend you check it out and come back to this entry, or if not, let me give you a quick breakdown on what it's about. Spoilers for Robots to follow. Robots follows Rodney Copperbottom, played by Ewan McGregor, son of Dishwasher Herb, played by Stanley Tucci, and Lydia, Diane, we- Diane Weist. Rodney doesn't want to be a dishwasher like Herb, instead he wants to be an inventor like his idol Big Weld, Mel Brooks, and moves to the creatively named Robot City. Rodney, along with his invention Wonderbot, Chris Wedge, travel to Robot City in the hopes that presenting Wonderbot to Big Weld will make his dreams come true. Rodney breaks into Big World Industries, where he learns it's been taken over by Big World's right-hand man, Ratchet, Greg Kinnear, who is working with his mother, Madame Gasket, Jim Broadbent, to exploit the poor citizens, the Rusties, of Robot City by taking away their access to spare parts and forcing them to pay ridiculous prices for upgrades. Those who can't pay are sent to the Chop Shop, which is run by Gasket, to become said upgrades. Rodney is laughed out of Big World Industries and teams up with Fender, Robin Williams, a Rusty he met earlier. The pair break into Big World Ball, where they discover Big World won't be attending. They are broken out by Cappy, Halle Berry, who is, ex- who is an executive at Big World Industries and later love interest of Rodney. Shenanigans ensue and Fender ends up in the chop shop, where he discovers Ratchet's evil plan. Meanwhile, Rodney and Cappy fly to Big World's mansion, where they meet a dishevelled Big World and leave disappointed. Fender, ca- Fender catches up with them and reveals the evil plan, and Rodney puts together a team consisting of himself, Cappy, Fender, and Fender's family, his sister Piper, Amanda Bynes, and found family Aunt Fan, Jennifer Coolidge, Lugner, Harland Williams, and Diesel, who is mute. They, along with Big Weld, who had a change of heart, and all the Rusties in Robot City take down a chop shop. Gasket is killed accidentally by her son after he knocks her into the incinerator, and Ratchet is stripped of his upgrades, and left a hand in the remnants of the chop shop alongside his... and... sorry, he's forced to live in the remnants of the chop shop alongside his disgraced father. The rest of the cast live happily ever after, with Big Weld back in control of his company, Rodney being an inventor and coupled with Cappy, Fender coupled with Loretta, Geargrinder, played by Natasha Lyonne in the US and Kat Dealey in the UK, Diesel finds a new voice, Herb becomes a musician, which was his dream, and Piper gets a new sister. Wait, what? Is robots transphobic? When watching Robots for the first time since coming out as trans, there were a few questionable moments that made me think, whoa, hang on, that's transphobic. But after thinking about them again, I started doubting myself. Surely it can't be that intentionally transphobic, right? It's a kid's film. Then I remembered, oh wait, it came out in the early noughties, which was riddled with transphobia. To find out whether this is just another transphobic film from the transphobic era, that was the early 2000s, I decided to break down the main three moments that made me wonder whether or not the film is transphobic. But before we start, I want to mention that there are elements of the film which are problematic in other ways. 
I felt the film constantly makes fat characters the butt of jokes. Aunt Fan is used as nothing more than a walking, ongoing joke, constantly knocking things over with her butt, farting excessively, and not being presented with the same level of awareness and intelligence as the other characters. She is such a sweet character and deserves to be treated with a lot more respect. I'm not fat, so of course I can't talk about this from a perspective I don't have, but it's important that we, as allies to fat individuals, take the time to listen to fat individuals and learn how to spot potential fat phobia in media and real life. I believe there is an argument to be made that the treatment of Aunt Fan is potentially fat phobic, but it's not my place to definitively say whether or not it is. I also think elements of the film are ableist, specifically in relation to Diesel, who is presented as lacking an identity without his voice, and his entire personality being written around the fact he wants to have a voice, but isn't allowed one unless it's going to be used as entertainment for voluble individuals. Also with Tim the Gatekeeper, Paul Giamatti, whose height is treated as a joke, and of course don't get me started on the fact the entire film's plot revolves around the villains literally exercising their eugenic beliefs but at least they're shown as being in the wrong. The film attempts to tackle the conversation about treating those less privileged than you with respect, but fails in so many areas. So that leads us to the question of whether or not the discussion or lack thereof of trans individuals is another one of those areas. To discuss this, here are the questions and points I want to put forward. Question 1. If baby Rodney was functioning perfectly fine and completely content without his extra part, why did they feel the need to force it on him and make him cry? Yep, we are starting right at the beginning of the film, right when Rodney is being made. Right after Rodney's baby form was completed, you see him happy and content. That is until his mother, L- L- Lydia, notices they missed a piece. Herb exclaims, We did want a boy, right, hun? And heads towards baby Rodney with a freaking mallet promising this won't hurt a bit. The joke, if you didn't get it because it wasn't funny, is that Rodney's parents forgot to give him his penis. Because a penis is of course the defining factor of being a little boy. Not. Okay, so the joke wasn't funny, at least by today's standards, but was it transphobic? It definitely plays into the idea that the genitalia you have determines whether or not you are a boy or a girl baby. This belief is a transphobic one, because genitalia has little to do with gender identity. It instead refers to sex, that is whether or not a baby is male or female, but even then sex is not a binary, which leads me to another type of prejudice the film displays. Robots is interphobic. Interphobia, if you didn't know, is the term used to describe prejudice against intersex individuals. Rodney was clearly born without genitalia. And he was, after settling down after he was completed, or born, happy and content up until the point his dad approached him with a mallet. The scene has horrific interphobic undertones, whether intended to or not. Rodney is seen as defective or not complete as a boy until he has his extra part, and only upon receiving his extra part is he complete. The film makes it clear that robots don't reproduce sexually. We literally see the baby making process, and it involves a lot more hammering... Anyway, we see the baby being made, and it doesn't involve sex. So the extra part clearly doesn't have a role in sexual reproduction. We also have to ask the question of whether or not robots urinate. Some robots consume oil, like it's coffee, and they eat nuts and bolts, so they must produce some kind of waste, right? I posed this question to one of my friends, and he pointed out that they do oil changes instead of peeing or pooping, like a flesh being wood. Such a situation would also not require the use of genitalia. So what is the point of it? Why does Rodney need an extra part to be confirmed as a boy robot? If for nothing more than aesthetics, then it's literally worthless. He could happily exist without it. If it works as a kind of sensory feeler that gives you pleasure, then I can see why it has a purpose, but also surely that's something that he could add by his own choice when he's more grown up, right? What does a baby need that for? To answer this question, I believe that yes, the scene is transphobic because it plays on the cis normative views of gender and uses sex and gender identity interchangeably. But as a whole, I believe the scene is more interphobic, forcing a baby to have surgery it didn't need to fit societal expectations of what constitutes being a boy or girl. Many intersex babies are assigned as either male or female at birth, but they don't need to have unnecessary surgery to determine whether or not they are a boy. This form of mutilation is something the intersex community and its allies have been protesting against for years. His parents made it clear Rodney was a boy, even without his extra part. He certainly wasn't happy about getting it, and there was no need to force it on him, especially not under the guise of a joke. Mutilating babies is not funny.
Question 2. What was the point of the second hand-me-downs moment? As Rodney grows up, his body naturally needs updating to match his age. His family isn't making much money and his parents can't afford to buy him new parts, so they need to rely on hand-me-downs. First, he receives hand-me-downs from his cousin Jeffrey, which are noticeably too big for him. That's fine, it's also relatable, I myself had to have hand-me-downs growing up, albeit with clothes and not body parts. But the second hand-me-downs moment? Was it necessary? As Rodney is going into high school, he receives his 12-year-old parts from his cousin Veronica. This isn't a problem necessarily, we've already established Rodney needs hand-me-downs. What I do have problems with are the comments being made about Rodney's hand-me-downs from Veronica. Lydia says, you know how popular she is, and Wonderbot Wolf whistles. These comments and reactions to Veronica's old parts are actually really creepy. These are the parts of a 12-year-old girl. We don't need those kinds of comments. They're essentially sexualizing a child, which is disgusting. But are the comments also transphobic? At face value, I wouldn't say the situation is a particularly transphobic one. In fact, it's the opposite. Rodney's parents have no issue giving their son hand-me-downs from a girl. That's pretty inclusive in my eyes. The problem, though, comes from the way the characters react to the hand-me-downs. They're treated like a joke. Rodney is visibly uncomfortable with the comments about the hand-me-downs, and it's supposed to be funny. I don't see what's so funny about a boy receiving hand-me-downs from a girl. At no point do they claim Rodney is a girl, just because he has parts that come from a girl. He is still clearly a boy. I don't think it's transphobic, but I also don't think the scene was necessary. It lasts for a few seconds, and it adds nothing to the story. There are better ways to refer to the awkwardness of puberty in my eyes, if that's what they are going for. Better ways than sexualizing body parts and treating breasts as a joke. Question 3. Is Fender trans? This is something I've seen a lot, especially within a trans community. First off, if you're trans and you see Fender as a trans individual, I completely support your view. But even if Fender is trans, is the way his transness is being depicted transphobic? Before we get into that, we need to answer another question. What the heck is going on with the clothes situation? As the big world, at the Big World Ball, Rodney and Fender wear fabric clothes, proving that fabric exists in this world, and implying all metallic components of a robot are part of his body. So does this mean any dresses or skirts we see which are metal are part of the robot's body? This is something we need to ask, because the whole argument that Fender is trans stems from the moment he ends up with a metal skirt and new coily hair. After which his sister Piper pipes up that she now has a sister. I need to make it clear, clothes nor body parts determine if you are trans or not. Fender having a skirt does not necessarily make him trans. If the body parts of robots, which we know, can change to determine their gender, then that means Rodney would also have been trans when he received Veronica's hand-me-downs. I personally don't believe that Fender is trans. He is simply just a man who wears a skirt. This is also what I believe the creators intended. He never refers to himself as being a different gender. That doesn't mean you're wrong if you think of him as being trans. I can definitely see elements of his character which do remind me of my own experience as a trans individual. It's also clear he's confident in his new look, and who are we to tell him he doesn't look good? If the creators didn't intend for us to see him as trans icon as a trans icon, the joke's on them. Because if he is a tra if he if he is trans, sorry, then that means he ends up in a sapphic relationship with Loretta, and we love to see queer women on our screens. But with this all said, is it transphobic? Yes. The joke is, if you didn't get it because it wasn't funny, is that Fender is a woman now because he has a skirt. You see, it's supposed to be funny because he's a man and now he's wearing a skirt, so now he's a woman because men don't wear skirts. <laughs> it's hilarious. Not. No, this is 100% transphobic rhetoric. So to conclude this discussion, yes, Robots is transphobic in a couple of places. Does that mean the film as a whole is transphobic? Probably not. There are plenty of films out there which have transphobic elements but aren't inherently transphobic as a whole. What I believe has happened here is that Robots is a victim of early 2000s casual transphobia. This type of gender mockery was com commonplace everywhere in the noughties. It was so common that most just didn't think twice about it. That doesn't mean it's not wrong, or that there weren't those fighting for it to be stopped. I think if we remove the transphobic elements of the film I mentioned, the film would hold strong on its own. It would still have many problematic elements, and I'm not saying it's a morally good film, but looking at the wider image, no robots is not transphobic. It is, however, a film with transphobic elements, with many problematic elements. It may be 17 years old, but we still need to have these discussions, especially with our children. 
Let me know your thoughts about robots in the comments. Also, let me know what Disney discussions you'd like to see next. Until next time, I wish you Boreda, Prinhanda, Nozwaifta, or Nozda, wherever you are in the world. Bye. <laughs>